Okay, can you hear me well? Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Maxim. I work uh, with Atato. Uh, we are a blockchain service provider and we are the organizer of this meetup. So uh, the reason uh, we organized it, for the, this is the fourth edition, and uh, we bring companies with a real life application um, in business blockchain for, uh, blockchain for enterprise. And uh, thank you for Omize this year to join us. Uh, we are very proud to have uh, one of the biggest blockchain company in Thailand to join our meetup. We had the pleasure to have a uh, on Bank last time and consensus. And this time we give the microphone to uh, one unicorn in Thailand. Uh, after that, you will see two other presentations. One from uh, Kedit, which is a company from Israel. They are going to join us by call and they are doing zero knowledge proof. So for developer, you will have a demo of their product and uh, what do they mean by that. The last part, Kaleido is a software company to run blockchain application that uh, we represent here in Thailand. So uh, Kunbum, which is here, is going to give you a presentation as well as a demo. Every time there will be some Q&A after the presentation. So feel free, uh, don't be shy to ask any questions. Uh, this is the point of this meetup is to understand more about blockchain for enterprise. So we welcome any questions. Then when we finish, of course, there will be some uh, beers and pizza and water for everybody. Thank you very much, and I hope you will enjoy the pre tonight's presentation. Alexei is here. Thank you very much for joining, and uh, I listen. Welcome everyone. Um, my name is Alexei. I'm from Omisiko. Before I kick this off, maybe two, three words. Introduction. Um, I'm German. I have been in Southeast Asia now for a couple of years. Um, Indonesia, Malaysia, and now since uh, I think three years here in Thailand. Um, I do not have a blockchain background. Actually, Omisiko is my first blockchain uh, r related job before I've been involved in like, all types of e-commerce companies. There's probably not a category of product out there, which I haven't sold yet online, but um, that is why blockchain is a huge learning curve um, for me, and uh, especially when we talk about this meetup about enterprise applications, it's probably almost, I see it as an advantage not coming from the blockchain world, because I think this is also one of the problems of the community, that it was very, very niche with a very cryptic language and when you're coming like from from a non-blockchain background uh, you then automatically speak more of the language of your clients the people whom you actually want to want to sell to um, but today i'm going to introduce to you the omg network this is our core product which is an ethereum layer 2 scaling solution and um, i'm going to outline a few examples actually how we work with enterprises. We have worked with multiple conglomerates here in Thailand. We have worked with Miner. We have worked with PTT, Citibank, etc. So I can share there some examples of how we work with them. And actually, I would be curious to also learn from you guys uh, if you already work uh, in blockchain related projects with enterprises, either here in Thailand or someone else in the world, what your experiences um, are. If you have any questions, um, please interrupt me right away. Uh, please don't be shy. Like we're here to exchange uh, ideas, and I'm very much looking forward to it. A um, few words about Omisi Go first. Um, in our mission and vision, we really believe that access to financial services makes the lives of people better. Uh, when we think about what are alternatives for the unbanked, like. Um, Western Union or what else there's one more uh, money gram out there crazy expensive really taking advantage of of people who don't have bank accounts for example so this is our aim is to build an infrastructure layer a platform layer allowing other applications to build on top of our platform so the way we see ourselves is if you're developing a country, we, we are the ones building the roads, the electricity, water, and then we would invite other people, contractors, to actually build on top 
of our platform. So our core product is the OMG network, but actually when we work with enterprises, we're also utilizing our other products, which uh, are an open source wa wallet, which is pretty much an access point to our network, and the O engine. And this is an engine to exchange tokenized assets within the wallet or on the network. Um, we're roughly 50 people scattered across the world uh, since we are a remote first company. Um, I would say probably one third is, is here in, in Bangkok. And you might have heard of Omise, Omise Payment. This is the largest payment gateway in, in Southeast Asia and um, we are a subsidy of Omise Holdings. Um, yeah, I was actually very excited when Maxim invited me to speak here about uh, enterprise because I think this is actually one further step of, of blockchain um, because it already implies that there is a customer, that there is, is a use case. So we're moving away from 2007, call it blockchain and get rich. Uh, 2018, of course, followed the bus. Um, we're talking less and less about uh, crypto, and we're actually talking more about the underlying blockchain. And then for us, it was 2019 to really build build our product, and now 2020, um, the topic blockchain enterprise, uh, how are we actually set, uh, selling our product? How do we actually start to make money with it? Um, how was this from the Omisa Go perspective? Um, we had the largest ICO in Southeast Asia, it was 35 million with the OMG token. Um, we didn't go bust, we're still here, luckily, <laughs> right? Um, but we really put our heads down, engineering team, and now we have an enterprise ready um, network, and we're actually gaining already some traction with the first use case, and we're gonna talk about this in a second. Um, I think you're probably familiar with this, like one of the core problems of blockchain uh, is the uh, low scalability, like Bitcoin, Ethereum, uh, roughly seven to 20 transactions per, per second. This is not competitive to centralized um, solutions, uh, for example, like Visa. And yes, there are always the 24,000 coming up. This is more of them like a theoretical value. On average, they run usually around three, four thousand transactions uh, per second. But this is really one of the core problem the OMG network aims to address, which is the scalability issue. So um, the Omise Go network is a scaling solution and right now we have a TPS of roughly 4,000. This is also for us uh, right now a theoretical value, but we have actually run tests on our current live network was 2,700, around about 3,000 transactions per second. So we are on a good track getting there. Um, moving on, so actually, what is the OMG network? A layer two solution. So first we have a layer one, which is like Ethereum or Bitcoin, and that has the advantage of being very decentralized and it's very secure and distributed across across the entire world, but key disadvantages are the, as mentioned, the slow transaction speeds, and it's actually quite expensive. Um, in average Ethereum, um, ERC-20 transaction is anywhere between eight cents to, to 40 cents for what we recorded over the past, uh, past months. And if you're an enterprise and you run thousands uh, of transactions per, per day, um, paying 20 or 30 cents is definitely definitely not an option. Um, so we have a child chain or a so-called layer two which sits underneath the root chain and um, it offers much higher transaction speed at a fraction of a cost but it combines like the best of both worlds as we're still utilizing the security element of the root chain. So every transaction on the layer two can also be verified 
on the, the layer one. So we're using the root chain for final consensus. It's actually a, a concept um, developed by uh, Mr. Ethereum himself, David Vitalik, and he actually wrote part of our, of our white paper. Going here a little bit more into detail of how layer two actually works. So again, on top we have our root chain, the layer one and the layer two, this is the OMG network. And really the goal is to shift all of the heavy workload onto the child chain. And then we're bundling up transaction and we're only sending the block hash for final consensus to the root chain. And basically has then the three main advantages. It's faster, it's efficient, but it doesn't compromise on the security level. This is when we look at uh, competitor products, um, you usually have to make a trade-off between speed, cost, and security. And this is where we see the main advantage of our, our product that we're not compromising on, on security because our goal is to build a financial services platform um, there can be zero compromise uh, around security. If, if there are any issues, then there won't be any funds deployed to your network. And going one level deeper how it works, again, here's the layer two, the OMG network. The user submits the transaction to our network, and then up to 64,000 transactions are bundled up into one block, and every 15 seconds, a block is submitted to the Ethereum root chain. And then pretty much as a, as a third party, we have so-called watchers who validate the transaction hashes. So actually what a watcher does, it compares the transaction hash on the uh, child chain and compares this to the transaction hash on the root chain and by this it can always confirm um, this is a valid transaction or um, as a user if you don't trust um, Omisigo as, as an operator you can always verify your transaction on, on the root chain so just go through go to any um, like etherscan any type of block explorer and you will still be able to verify your transaction and yeah, there in terms of speed, uh, around about 4,000 TPS, much cheaper. Um, and again, you can always revert back to, to the main chain. Imagine that you deposited funds. Yeah, you have your financial services application on, on the layer two. Um, for whatever reason, Omisigo goes bust and disappears as, as an operator you can always revert back towards um, the root chain and actually uh, take out your, your funds. This is one of the security concepts in there. So if we as a company, as a network, go down, the funds are not gone, um, you can always get them, get them back, which is actually not the case if, if it's any type of centralized um, service. If the server goes down, like your, your funds are gone. And this pretty much summarizes our core value proposition, being, being secure, as I said, this is the number one priority for any type of financial services application. Open access, this is very important um, for us, that we're open source and we are permissionless. This is within our vision of providing financial services uh, for anyone. Again, if you're building roads in a country, you're pretty much allowing anyone to use um, to use those roads. Um, scalable, I think we talked about this. Um, maybe one more word on that is what we're also trying to, um, to emphasize on, that we are in use case agnostic um, layer. So any type of um, fin financial service transaction we can support o on our network. And regulated. This is one important thing for us. I think this is also something what the industry needs. More more regulations, more clarity and guidelines and pretty much a playbook on how to operate. And we actually have one venue which is in the midst of an uh, FCA application. This is the 
um, financial regulator in the UK. So this is actually one of the most trusted, respected um, regulators in, in the world. So indirectly, they also gonna regulate our network by regulating a player which sits on top. So this is something what we definitely want to embrace more, more regulations within the financial service space and blockchain. Um, on, on the security part, our smart contracts are audited by Consensus and um, uh, Quantstamp and they have pretty much 100% uh, test, test coverage. And here, as I mentioned, the, the exit mechanics, so whenever the network goes down or there's invalid transaction, um, your, funds, your funds are safe. Um, one, one maybe more important point to mention, this is what the trading venue we're engaging with is paying a lot of attention to, is the non-custodial non part of, of our, our network. At, at no point in time does the network have possession or access towards your, towards your funds, uh, which is different if you're trading like on a centralized exchange. At some point, then the exchange will take custody of, of your funds, which is a huge security risk. And in any type of institutional trading, if you think about the NASDAQ, uh, for example, it's unthinkable that they would take custody over the funds in the trillions, basically, they're, they're trading every day would be huge security risk and it wouldn't go through regulators. So that is actually one, one quite important part to mention. A um, little bit of an overview of whom are we working with. Um, I think there are then two, two major parts. Yeah, one is like the blockchain first. This would be like the open network um, projects. Um, my Ether wallet or Hydro, those are wallet um, providers or companies like Curve Grid, Message, Status. Um, I see them like once we build the road, they're really like the first uh, contractors coming in, so they're building applications on top of, of the network, and then it's the enterprises um, like PPT, Miner, Citibank, Central, etc. They are coming in and really building then the condos uh, on top of the land and building the scalability. As I mentioned before, we're also engaging with uh, regulated trading venues, uh, but there, unfortunately, I'm not allowed to, to disclose those. But I, I think I can go more into detail what we're doing with enterprises right now. Um, to mention maybe the Network Alliance, UPA, and anyone heard about this one? Yeah, um, yeah so Omiseko joined the, the UPA Alliance, which is like um, an alliance of a range of blockchain companies. Um, and they're, they're building out use cases. There's quite a bit in the making as well. Um, but let's let's take one example of what we do with enterprises. So let's assume we have a conglomerate like we have so many here in Thailand, like a central um, a central group, for example, where we have one parent holding and many different company um, subsidies, and each one of them has their own loyalty program, you know, program A, B, and C, and underneath they have different different brands and they can be completely um, unrelated like how Central has restaurants, malls, department stores, whatever, yeah, super random. So let's assume here brand X has a credit card or uh, financial services arm and a brand B which is car insurance uh, but then they also own company uh, Z which let's say is a taxi company or like a ride, a ride sharing company. Um, and what our, our products do, this is where we're utilizing our wallet and our O engine, is connecting pretty much those different brands, which you thought of. Because if they're now operating on a centralized system, it's actually quite difficult for them to connecting those services. Uh, how it's working right now is actually that um, brand Y to brand Z, they're sending Excel files back and forth. Or uh, a common case um, with, with airline loyalty points or credit card loyalty points, they actually sell their points to different companies. Yeah? You can buy 
10,000 uh, Thai, Thai Airways miles and then you can give them out to your customers. And again, how this works, they're sending you an Excel file and then three months later when your program is completed, you do a manual financial reconciliation, which is super slow, it's faulty, expensive, and as a parent holding, you really don't know what is going on on the lower layers. And this is where we're working on with a range of companies actually closing this gap, giving the parent holding a very clear view of what is what is going on between the different points programs and actually increasing the customer utility that you can now use your loyalty points across the entire uh, holding structure. And this is actually a screenshot from our O engine where we have tokenized all the different loyalty loyalty programs. And then actually in the next step we are creating a new exchange pair. So we're taking company A and company C and we set an exchange rate uh, that they can start trading and converting um, those loyalty points. Um, let's, let's use one example. So we have here one user who wants to purchase car insurance um, valued at 200x. Um, this person then looks into um, his wallet and sees, oh, I have um, company B tokens. Um, and then I can use uh, the exchange rate at 200 X equals then 100 B, I can use those tokens actually then to pay for the service. And we also have a live demo. Not live demo, recorded demo. So that was from Citigroup. They sponsored um, a trail run up, up in the north. So again, what I emphasized before that we are more of an ag use case agnostic layer. So if you want to understand the OMG network compared to something like a Linux, uh, for example, like really like a, a pair of rails, then, then you can build on top. So we're not really focusing on um, directly solving a problem, but the way I think we can look at it is characteristics of good use cases, which we can build on top of our network. So first, it's high transaction volume, because this is where our main advantage comes into place of higher throughput compared to, to root chain. Um, transfer of assets between entities and, and jurisdictions. This is the example which we have seen here with conglomerates in, in Thailand, when they own so many different um, subsidies, and it's pretty much impossible for them to connect them, and there's so much reconciliation um, going on. So this is the part of an exchange uh, exchange of 
assets. And there's a need for tokenization of, of those assets. Yeah. Uh, when you're talking in fiat, it's pretty easy actually to convert one fiat from, from another one. But how do you convert then a loyalty point A to a loyalty point B if there's no underlying value um, in it? And, and then lastly, there's a transparency and uh, auditability requirement in it, which is, again, the example of the loyalty points or whatever transaction you, you, you would use. Um, the way the data is stored on the network uh, allows you to, to verify and actually trace the history of transaction much faster than as it would be by sending Excel files back and forth. Um, I not only want to talk about products, I actually also wanted to talk about enterprise sales in blockchain. This is also where I'm curious if you have already some experiences in, in this regard, because um, there are a look about the customer we're, we're selling to and what type of, of pain points we, we're coming across there. So usually when we open up the sales pitch, or actually they, they come to us, they're, they're quite curious. They, they want to learn, they, they want to know about blockchain, but in 99% of cases, they don't really have an idea what, what they want. Huh? They just, they just want to sit, learn, and see what we can do. So the first pain point we're engaging is like the lack of blockchain understanding, and actually what is even worse is the misperceptions around it. Yeah, when uh, you say, oh, I work in, in blockchain, ah, Bitcoin, heard about this huge scam, right? Um, so there's often quite a negative uh, connotation um, towards, um, which to a certain degree is probably also fair because there's a lack of successful um, implementations. Um, and from the conglomerate side, the fear of being a first mover in, in the space. Uh, like in old family-owned business, they're not really known to be like risk takers, first movers in the space. So it's more, we have been in this business for the last 150 years and we want to make it last 150 years. And what also gets clear in, in the early conversations with customers is the unclear cost-benefit um, outcome. So what, what do you ask me to invest and what is actually the benefit I'm getting out of it? Is it new sales? Is it, is it more loyalty? Is it cost savings? So what is it really what I'm getting out? And then lastly, the high tech replacement uh, cost. There's always so much tech legacy in there and it's quite expensive to to replace this. Um, so our approach at Omisigo is um, always to define first like what is really the problem, what we're solving for you. Is it a sales uplift? Is it a cost reduction? Really what are we trying to, to figure out? And what is the X for Y? Uh, we're always asking for investment from them, but of course then the first question uh, back is what am I getting out? Like how do I pitch this then to my boss, I need to show something in, in the numbers. And then lastly, like the case studies, like examples of uh, successful products, uh, successful implementations, what we have done. So if you have any experience in, in this space of blockchain enterprise sales, uh, I would be very curious to hear about your, your experiences and about, about your approach. Um, and yeah, if you, if you want to get in touch with us, like there are different ways of how to work with us. We have, um, as I said, the open open source network. You can go on onto GitHub and start connecting to, to our network. Um, what is what is interesting, if you're an in engineer, we have an ODP, an open developer program. Um, you can apply and sign up and then you get direct access um, to our engineering team. We have right now 250-ish um, developers in, in this program and a range of projects of all different types of applications from super, super professional companies to just engineers sitting pretty much uh, after hours and building a applications, but we pretty much support them across the board. Um, and then, of course, if you belong to, to an enterprise, uh, come talk to us, come speak with us, and let's, let's see what we can do for your business. In, 
in blockchain. Yeah. Thank you very much. <coughs> thank you very much, Alexei. Actually, a great presentation, and uh, thank you very much for bringing up the use case of uh, loyalty point. This is something that actually we have been talking with our customers as well. I think it's a great application for blockchain. And uh, thank you as well for reviewing the pain points that uh, we see currently in some of uh, meeting with customer. Any questions from the attendants? Okay. Hi, my name is Alex. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, of course, we follow uh, the OMG uh, very closely, uh, and their team, and they're doing great work. And and now there seems to be a, a private network running. Um, can you tell a little bit about that? Um, are there big companies uh, running tests on it, or just some individual uh, developers, or what can be expected from that? Okay, so first we 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 have like a a public beta right now. So um, this is where we're running like the last tests on it. The consensus and uh, CoinStamp are almost almost done with with their work. So we're expecting there an update soon uh, on the. Um, on the private networks, this is where we're working with our enterprise clients. Um, this this depends basically what type of solution do they want. Yeah, some want some are fine with uh, connecting towards uh, towards a public a public network. Uh, others just want it um, just within within their company. Um, or what we have also done this was among the first um, projects that they only want the tokenization. They want the wallet, but they don't want the network at all. So this depends on the um, on the clients um, on the clients' goal, what they want. Yeah. Any more questions from the attendant? I mean, Omizi is here, so we need to take advantage of it. Yeah. Well, may I, I would just rebond on one thing that actually that uh, we are seeing in enterprise blockchain is like actually on the pain point that you mentioned. It was a very different scene, I mean, back in 2018, but starting last year, actually since the middle of the year, uh, the meeting we had with customer were completely different. At the beginning, as you mentioned, it was just, oh, can you teach me about blockchain? What can I do with it? Now the company that actually meeting, they already have some projects, they make their study on their own, and you're gonna see in the next six months, some project coming up with real use case application. You're right to mention that actually people want to get something out of blockchain. They don't want to run it just for the buzzword. They want to make money out of it and to have great returns. And I think it's really starting to come. I mean, your company is building some layer two applications and some others are doing uh, actually POCs and MVP at the moment. We are just very impatient in the blockchain world. We want everything to go fast. But the scene is actually very different from what we have seen already six months ago. So it's going to be a great 2020, I believe. And um, yes, any questions from Alexei? He's here. Yeah, sure. Okay. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah. So um, the Omis, uh, as a company, they have uh, had a their payment processor uh, quite big. And have you? Uh, Contacted uh, some of those merchants and to, to try out the, the network, mm -hmm. or you know, to see if it works or not. And and because uh, I understand, if you change people to a new technology, as you said, they don't want to be the first mover. Yeah, and I have experience with that as well. It's very difficult to to get them uh, on board. So have you already experience with some of those merchants that said, hey, I, I'd like to try it. Yeah, I think that that is actually a very good question. I actually, this is usually one of the first questions which we're getting asked because you know, when you know, people who are interested or companies who are interested, they, they look the same as you and as at the entire holdings. They see Omisi with this huge network of, of merchants, which is potentially very, very valuable. Um, but two, two points to consider here first. From the Omisi Go side, our full focus was to deliver the network first and not pitching 
a product already to merchants which is not yet ready, which might be faulty, especially again, there's such a high importance on security and there's a zero risk um, tolerance uh, on it. Um, secondly, um, yes, there's this large network of, of merchants, but it's always like a bilateral uh, conversation with every, with every merchant. Um, so again, for now, it is still our focus to launch the network. And once this is all, all live and set and we feel very confident about it, then I think we can reconsider um, talking to, to those merchants. But right now, we are looking at more as two separate companies, like um, Omisigo and Omise Payment. Yes, we belong to the same parent company, but still um, are two different. Correct. Those two thousand, yeah. yes, two thousand um, seven hundred uh, were tested on our beta network. Okay. And you built for that. Yes, like uh, our CTO is it always putting this way, like it's going to be a luxury program uh, problem once we run out of throughput. <laughs> so uh, let's let's get to two thousand first or two thousand seven hundred first. Um, then then we did a good job on the business side and. So is that Like they're they're in the final leg of um, completing their tests. Very very cool. <laughs> any more questions? Actually, do you see any other company onboarding on this kind of programs? Um, actually, we see a lot of interest um, on on those type of um, applications. Um, usually, the ask or where we see more of the demand. First is like on products like the wallet or the O engine, a as you said, because it's also the, I would say, simpler use case. It's simpler to explain and there's a more direct pitch for it. It's easier to outline, as I mentioned, the X, X for Y. But from the view of Omisigo, this is not so much in, in our focus right now. As again, full focus on, on launching the network and then we actually work with several partners where we then hand over the contract or they're then the developing um, partner in um, using our open source uh, platform and then connecting uh, them if they want to the network. But it's not something what we're focusing on as a company. Great, Great. thank you. Uh, just a quick question. Well, what will be the the uh, kind of fee, is, is it going to be a, a fee on you know, using the layer 2 or how, how do you uh, charge the, the, uh, the enterprise? In there first we have to differentiate whether an enterprise when they go onto the public network and if they're on, on a public network there's this one pricing mechanism. This is what we're working on right now. I can disclose exactly like a dollar figure how much it would be, but given that we are in Ethereum la layer 2 solution, our pricing will be related to an Ethereum transaction. And uh, we have the very clear value proposition of being cheaper than root chain, and we need to be significantly cheaper in order to provide value. Yep, w one more. So you mentioned that each, uh, on the child chain, the blocks, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, the transactions on each block of the child chain were going to be something like 35,000 of them, or I don't remember exactly what you said. Um, and then you said you could audit that on the Ethereum network. So, so my question is, if I have a transaction, when I look at the Ethereum network, am I going to see like, I'm sorry, this is nuts and bolts, but am I going to see the transaction that points to the block on the child chain, or am I actually going to see my transaction ID. 
In what we are submitting to the root chain is a Merkle tree. Are you familiar with the concept of Merkle trees? Okay. It's like through the Merkle tree, you can pretty much then verify down through a range of, of transactions. So I can't tell you exactly how, how, it's, going to, how it's going to work technically, but um, as I was emphasizing, we're using the root chain for consensus and the watcher is comparing the transaction hash on the child chain to the transaction hash on, on the main chain. So there is a definite connector between the two child, child chains. This is also then the way that when the child chain goes down, you can always exit via the main chain because there is an audible verifier ver verifiable data stream, transaction stream. All right, but thank you very much, Alexei. Thank you, Maxine. <laughs> well, now we're going to actually ask uh, our friend at Kedit from Israel to join by call to make a presentation on zero knowledge proof. This is something which is not really understood by a lot of people, uh, including some developers, but uh, actually uh, Kedit uh, has a great product and explaining it very well. And uh, actually, Leonid is going to make a presentation now. Just give us two minutes to set it up. Hey, Leonid, can you can you hear us? Can you can you hear us? Yeah, it's always the problem when you do something live. <laughs> it's never <laughs> working. <laughs> Leonid, can you can you hear us? Can you hear me? Yeah, very well. You can go ahead. Okay, great. So, hi everyone. My name is uh, Anonid. I work in Kedit. Um, we are based in Tel Aviv and Paris. Um, uh, Kedit is a privacy company. Uh, we leverage uh, zero knowledge proofs, a privacy layer for blockchain. In order to facilitate uh, distributor ledger uh, adoption uh, by enabling uh, companies uh, to transact on a uh, shared ledger without exposing uh, any sensitive data. Okay. Um, so, first of all, we're going to see a short presentation about credit uh, uh, and zero knowledge proof. And then we're going to see a short demo. Um, so, let's uh, jump right in. Okay, so um, Kedit was uh, established on uh, in 2016 when our co-founders uh, uh, encountered the, the dilemma of um, basically uh, this is the for uh, for the blockchain, uh, which is based on uh, sharing the data and seeing the data out there, as opposed to uh, protecting that same data. Um, so uh, if, uh, if everything is out there, uh, it is uh, possible uh, to everyone see 
everything, and therefore uh, this makes um, the blockchain less secure. Um, and uh, this is uh, what uh, brought them uh, to consider this problem and how we can solve it. Um, so uh, this is solved by uh, zero knowledge proof. We basically allow, um, instead of sharing the data and uh, seeing it out there on the public domain, uh, we are proving the data mathematically and uh, sharing that uh, with the distributed ledger instead of sharing the whole data. Um, okay, so this is how we explain uh, this easily. I'm sure some of you are familiar with your own tool, but um, uh, for some of you that, that are not familiar, uh, I'm sure you're familiar with this uh, children's book, Where is Waldo? Which basically um, um, uh, requires from uh, kids uh, to find Waldo, who is uh, located on very complex uh, uh, painting. And uh, the, the idea is to find Waldo and, uh, and uh, to discover with a picture, uh, clue, this is Waldo, right? Okay. Um, so um, the premise is such, uh, in Tel Aviv, uh, there is a prankster who is going to all the children's uh, uh, bookstores and then libraries and um, basically replacing the valid uh, Where's Waldo books with um, uh, mock-up books which are exactly the same with my one small difference. The Waldo is not there. So uh, the kids is buying this book, and uh, they are checking the um, checking the and trying to find the Waldo, and um, it's difficult uh, to find or impossible to find because Waldo is obviously not there, and therefore the kid is losing his trust in the um, in the in the system basically. Um, he cannot find the Waldo anywhere. Um, so uh, there is a there is a problem with that. And so the solution is uh, we have to prove that the kids uh, uh, somehow that the world is in fact in the painting, but without disclosing the uh, the actual secret data, which is um, the coordinates of world. Okay. So what we can do is we ask from a uh, librarian or a seller to cut a, uh, have a big uh, envelope and to cut a small hole in that black envelope uh, and only to show us we'll go through that hole in the uh, envelope. By this we can uh, prove that the world is indeed in the, uh, in the actual picture. Um, and after we proved it to, to, the, to the kid, we, we can close the envelope again, shake the envelope, and give it back to the to the child. And therefore, we proved that the what we did is in the picture, but without disclosing the coordinates. So this is the um, basic uh, basic idea of how uh, to represent the knowledge proof with all the steps, uh, including the setup stage and the, the masking stage, etc. Um, uh, on a, a, a simple example. Um, okay, so um, the next step is uh, architecture. So let's talk about let's talk about, about a little bit about architecture. Um, we can see here we can see a zero uh, this, here we can see a Kenneth node which uh, leverages a zero, zero knowledge proof. Um, so the, um, uh, these lines indic indicate the, um, the actual uh, uh, model of uh, Kevit, uh, while uh, this side indicates the blockchain. So we are blockchain agnostic, meaning uh, that we uh, already embedded in some of the blockchains, and we can easily integrate to, to most of them, or even without blockchain on, the, on the SQL. For example, um, just by uh, adding a connector to our uh, system. Um, okay, so the heart of the system is the backend server, 
which basically um, uh, performs the, the actual com uh, calculations, which is in turn is connected to PostgreSQL uh, SQL Server. Um, um, uh, the uh, access to this server is done via Kdit library, via SDK or API, which is connected to a uh, customer app, well as also su supporting HSM. And um, um, the uh, actual proofs, which are computationally heavy, are uh, being done by proof workers. Uh, proof workers are uh, stateless servers, which are um, horizontally scalable, and we are connecting to them via Revit and Q. Okay, so this is uh, on the architecture. Um, uh, Kedit asset transfer uh, allows uh, you to move, uh, um, uh, have a few features which are on top of, uh, of uh, most of the, uh, the uh, of, uh, blockchain protocols. Um, uh, which allows us to do a few, a few interesting things. For example, in addition to issuing assets pu uh, publicly, we are, we are also able to uh, issue assets privately without anyone on the blockchain knowing uh, what was issued to, uh, to, and to, to whom it was issued. Basically, what is the amount, what is the asset type. Another thing uh, that uh, Kedit Asset Transfer supports is mul multiple assets in the same uh, network, which allow us to um, uh, to basically have a different um, currencies or maybe uh, uh, di different uh, stocks or and such uh, under the same network. Um, Another thing that we can do, obviously, which is the heart of the system, is to transfer ownership privately between two, uh, two players without disclosing that the, who transferred what to whom uh, and what was the asset type. We allow um, uh, proof scalability, which uh, basically means that the more nodes we have on the network, the faster it is uh, to prove some statement. Uh, we also allow uh, not to plan uh, SDK and uh, very um, easy enterprise deployment. Uh, so those are, those are the basic features. We have a few more advanced features, such as confirmations um, and uh, attachments uh, and a few more. Um, a few use cases. So. Um, one uh, most common uh, uh, use case is private asset transfer, in which um, um, we would like to distribute assets uh, privately without disclosing, uh, uh, without disclosing uh, the fact that assets were, were moved from point to point. Another use case is authenticity and ownership tracking. For example, um, in chain of uh, um, of diamonds uh, transfer uh, from a point to point, um, it is easy to, um, uh, to, to, to to think of fraudulent scenarios in case we know what is being moved uh, from, from one point to another, and therefore it is important uh, to, to, this, to, to have this uh, in private man manner and uh, without uh, the, um, the points uh, through which uh, are something to, to be aware of what in, in, is in the package. But uh, on the other hand, still to be able to prove that whatever is in the package is correct content of that package. Um, another use case is insurance from prevention, um, which uh, basically um, protects insurance company from um, from double um, uh, double insurance claim. So, for example, if I want to um, to have double uh, to double my uh, my payment from from insurance company, I am uh, able to uh, address to two companies, and then uh, uh, while I, will, I have already uh, used my uh, uh, used my insurance to, to task 
uh, to another uh, pay, uh, payback from that uh, from another insurance company, since the, uh, the insurance company are not communicating at, the, at this point between them, uh, because uh, certain regulations such as GDPR and uh, also some of the business business needs su such as not wanting to disclose uh, your uh, data to the, your competitors, preventing from insurance company uh, the sharing of the data. But in case we are able to prove that uh, that certain individual has uh, already used his right on uh, on a specific claim, already got his pay, uh, money back, we are able to signal the other uh, com uh, competitors that, in fact, um, uh, we sh you shouldn't tell him pay him another time, okay? Since he has already used his uh, payment. Okay, Leonid, maybe uh, you can you can share the application uh, with Alice or uh, how the clients are actually using uh, zero knowledge proof. Excuse me. Maybe you can share the the uh, the, con the example you have with uh, Alice, yes, and uh, how your clients yes, are actually using zero knowledge proof. Yes, of course. So um, so let us uh, see the proof of age demo. Okay, so um, uh, the demo is going to be, to present, uh, going to be presented in um, Jupyter Notebook. So therefore, I would like to, to introduce the players of this uh, demo uh, in order to make it uh, easier to understand because uh, uh, it's going, it's, it's relatively dry, so, so uh, it's gonna be uh, beneficial for us. So the players are um, Alice, a National Bank and Supermarket, so um, Alice is um, 25 years old. She wants to buy a drink in the supermarket by using a self-checkout point of sale. But um, uh, when she she wants to buy uh, her drink, uh, basically a age verification pops up and um, it presents her with two options. One option is to wait for cashier. And uh, in order to approve, uh, to present her ID to, to, to the cashier and uh, to approve that she is in fact over 18. Um, and the other option is to scan her uh, identification card and uh, to do it automatically. So uh, she doesn't want to wait for the cashier and um, therefore she will uh, use the uh, uh, automatic option. The supermarket. Uh, is obligated to verify age upon sale uh, of uh, alcohol, and uh, um, we would not like Alice would not like to give all her uh, uh, details to the uh, to the supermarket since, uh, given the opportunity, uh, the supermarket will, will send her spam mail and will learn some uh, demographic data of uh, about Alice that uh, she would not like him to uh, to learn. Uh, also, the supermarket trusts the bank, so therefore, um, everything uh, that is verified by bank is going to be um, uh, accepted by the supermarket. The bank, at some point, physically verifies uh, Alice's identity and generates token accordingly uh, to Alice in private matter. Um, uh, so. Um, we, uh, the bank also generates reverse tokens, which is uh, being done by formula 200 minus the age. So in our case, since Alice is uh, uh, 25, she will get 25 tokens and 175 reverse tokens. Why would we like to get reverse tokens? Why can't we prove a, a, a Alice's age with regular token? The reason is, if I have 25 age tokens and I would like to prove that I'm less than a certain age, less than uh, 18, let's say, um, then I would be able to share only part of my token and therefore um, it is, um, it's, I won't be able to prove in valid matter that in fact I'm owner of enough tokens to, uh, to, uh, to prove the upper limit of my age. The two uh, uh, token types, uh, which we are going to represent in this scenario, is in the following format. 
National Bank indicates that uh, these tokens have been issued by National Bank, and uh, nobody else on this uh, on this network is able to um, issue tokens from this type. Then we have age or inverse age, which indicates the uh, the type of this token. We indicate that, that this uh, token has been issued to Alice. So if Bob comes and try to prove his age with Alice's tokens, he won't be able to. And uh, we have the year since uh, each year is we're going to to have to reissue the tokens to okay, in order to prove her new age. Okay, so the flow of the of this now is going to be as such. The issue is from Bank to Alice by this uh, confirming that she is 25 years old indeed. Um, the straightforward thing to go from here is basically to give viewing rights, and by viewing rights I mean uh, viewing key on her wallet to the supermarket. Uh, but when I do this, it basically allows the, um, the supermarket to see everything in my wallet, and therefore I would not like to do that, since I might have additional sensitive data in my wallet. So what I do instead, I create a temporary wallet, I move only the tokens that I need to to that wallet, and I transfer them back immediately. So I move 18 tokens to temporary wallet, and I immediately transfer them back, and then I share the viewing rights for this uh, temporary wallet to the, um, to the uh, supermarket. Um, and he will be uh, only able to see the data in the temporary wallet, and therefore only the 18 tokens. Okay, so this is the flow. It's a uh, pretty straightforward. So now let's see the Jupyter notebook. Right. Um, second. What is the Jupyter notebook? I'm go we're going to skip uh, all the stuff that I already done in order to save some time. So this is basically the definition of some basic functions. Then we, we are going to do um, some uh, just the setup. So I'm going to start with wallet creation. We were basically creating the wallets for all three entities, for Alice, for supermarket, and the wallet. Then after that, we are uh, defining them into system and importing them. So, uh, so you can see that we're actually importing the wallets into the, into the blockchain. And at this point, we are going to create some rules which basically allows uh, the bank to issue um, to issue the, uh, the tokens, okay? And we are actually issuing some wallets, um, uh, some uh, some tokens to the uh, to Alice from National Bank. Okay, so we can see that this is done relatively fast within nine seconds. Now we are going to run the proof age. So we can see that we are generating temporary wallet. We are creating proof that Alice's age is at least 18 years. We are also proving the upper limit in the same uh, in the same time. Uh, so we will actually basically we prove proven age between uh, 18 and 65. As you can see, this takes some time uh, uh, due to the fact that this actually runs on Ethereum and. Uh, uh, in this um, version, it, uh, um, between block generation, there are take 10 seconds. So you can see that it takes a few seconds. So um, uh, so we, proven, we have proven that Alice is over 18. We are currently proving, proving that Alice is over uh, under 65, so she's within this age. And we are deleting the uh, temporary wallet since it's uh, already uh, possible to uh, to delete them as we have their uh, viewing key, and at this point the su supermarket performs the validation, and in fact we see that it is between the age of 18 to the age of 65. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you so, so much. Uh, so there is it. Yeah. Th thank you, Leonie, for the uh, presentation. I know it's a bit difficult for people, even a bit beginner, to. Uh, to try to under understand the open knowledge proof. 
uh, especially these applications for bank uh, insurance uh, and sometimes that people don't really see and don't really use it uh, every day but this is something which is actually changing the financial uh, scope so thanks a lot Leonid for, for the presentation and um, any technical questions from the audience? Uh, hello, thank you for the presentation. Uh, my question uh, is, where can I find the Jupyter Notebook that you just showed? Is that publicly available? Leonid, did you heard the question? So can you repeat it please? Where can I find what? The Jupyter Notebook that you just presented, is it public? <laughs> the Notebook is public, yes. Um, where, uh, we are a part of uh, 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 of credit efforts is um, to uh, to leverage the uh, the, uh, the uh, standardization effort of uh, zero knowledge proof, and uh, we are uh, uh, co-founders of uh, zero knowledge proof .org, which are um, uh, basically working on standardization with top minds of. Uh, of, uh, uh, of the industry and the uh, of the uh, education uh, and uh, which has a uh, next event in London in, on April. Okay, thank you very much. Hey, thanks, Leonid, uh, for the presentation. This is Guillaume with Atato, and uh, to to explain a bit why we think that zero knowledge proof is important is that. Uh, you know, one of the limitations that people have with public blockchains is that things that happen on a public blockchain are public. And so, uh, you know, for the example of uh, making a transaction when you want to buy stuff in a supermarket, sometimes you are requested to purchase things and provide additional information. Uh, one of the problems we see with today with, uh, you know, information system is that they collect all this information about you, they keep it, and then they benefit from it and they exploit it. And entire businesses are built around this. Facebook, Google are a very good example. Now, uh, some people have recognized that this is a problem in information systems and that there are other ways to do it. So, when Leonid showed us an example where you don't feel your age, but you reveal that your age is within a certain range, then there is all the complex mathematics and technology, which, you know, two years ago was just mathematical papers. And Leonid has shown us today's live software that people can use and build on. So it's really amazing to see that, and congratulations, Kedit. Uh, cool. And really, they have the top minds and the top researchers on the planet uh, working there. Um, and so what this allows you to do is to build applications that behave differently. Instead of hoarding data, uh, you're just going to ask for proof of certain information. So you can imagine in the future when um, you register to a new bank, for example, and you're already registered with somebody else, you're not going to be sending 200 pages of document again to the other bank. And you're not going to be revealing all the personal information that today is spread out everywhere. Instead, you will use systems like this that will let you prove that, yeah, you have a certain income and, yep, you are a resident in this country and so on and so forth. And so, uh, you know, it's, it's a bit tough sometimes to, to put those things and to, to see them in practice, like where it's going. But those applications, this is what they enable. And so this is why we think this was important to take the opportunity to talk about zero knowledge proof today. And I hope that uh, you found this presentation uh, interesting and maybe that it will raise some question about what is zero knowledge proof. And so just like Leonid mentioned, the zero knowledge proof .org, uh, maybe if you want to share a bit more about the, the organization, what it aims to achieve, and then perhaps how people can get in touch with Kedit and, and to start building. Um, yeah, sure. Um, so, um, uh, so zero knowledge proof dot org is uh, the name of the site, obviously. Um, uh, and you're welcome to sign up. Uh, we are. I think we're still looking for stickers on the uh, uh, cryptography domain um, uh, for zero knowledge proof. And um, uh, at credit, uh, uh, also uh, credit dot com. Um, uh, you are welcome to, to visit. We have a uh, demo um, uh, which you are able to, to have the presentation uh, with a little bit more graphic 
the presentation that I showed you. Um, uh, so you all welcome uh, to proceed. Thank you very much, Leonid. Any any more questions? No problem. Oh, yeah, well, one more question. Ah, thank you. Um, the presentation was very exciting. Thank you so much. Uh, I, I have uh, a little bit of technical question for you, um, I guess. So, um, what you show us is like the sort of like primitive um, sort of instruction, right, of issuing um, token and sending token. Um, my question is like, to which degree can we create custom logic in zero knowledge um, platform right now? Um. Um, to what degree can we create zero knowledge? Sorry, I didn't hear the end of the sentence. Uh, the custom logic. Um, the custom logic. Uh, uh, to which degree can we create custom logic, uh, meaning something similar to smart contract um, and embed it into you know, zero, knowledge, uh, zero knowledge proof system? Because right now, um, what, what we saw is that. Um, you know, we can prove that the, tra the, the transaction, the token transaction happened and the token issuance happened. Um, but if we want to create some sort of other logic as well, um, you know, to which degree can that happen right now? Or is it still in the academia stage at, at this point? Um, um, uh, so, um, so uh, can you just uh, great question, first of all. Can you ask tra transfer is um, not uh, using the entire functionality of smart contracts? Um, but uh, we use most of it, um, so we are able to to bypass the, the programmability of the uh, uh, of the smart contracts with other means, uh, such as uh, uh, attachments, and um, basically most of the functionality is uh, the atomic swaps uh, is also uh, an option. Um, and we, we, we are able basically to, to, uh, to have most of the functionality that we have in the, in the, uh, um, in the smart contracts uh, in uh, our system as well. Any more questions for Leonid? Yeah. One more. Uh, my question is, uh, is CKP like, is there like, uh, like a, set, a common pattern that you could use, like a lambda for, for a functional programming that, that you can uh, re reuse them to, to compute a, a zero knowledge proof generally? Or you, do you have to come up with a uh, custom logic for each problem? <coughs> Um, um, okay, so um, it, it's a difficult uh, question for me to answer. I'm not a cryptographer, but um, so there is a difference between zero knowledge proof, which is an open source, um, to to get it as a transfer pro uh, protocol, which leverages zero knowledge proof. Um, but uh, to speak generally, uh, everything that can be proven in the open can be proven with zero knowledge proof, and this is uh, again proven can be proven mathematically. Um, uh, so this means basically uh, it's very flexible, and you can use it. Uh, you're welcome to visit uh, zero knowledge proof.org and to see the open source that they have sent. It's a uh, head there. Thank you. I hope this answers your question. Thank you very much, uh, Leonid. Okay, uh, thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for joining. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Guys. Thank you. Have a good day. Um, so that's great because uh, what we want to do uh, at those meetup is, of course, presenting uh, 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 use cases for businesses, but as well software that actually we are using to uh, develop blockchain platform for enterprise clients. So we try to have this balance between uh, technical and non-technical. And uh, for the third presentation, uh, we are going to present uh, Kaleido. And Kaleido is a software that actually at Atato we are using, f which basically every platform that we are building. So it's kind of simple, it's uh, very user friendly, 
and uh, Kun Boom, which is our full uh, stack uh, engineer, is going to make you uh, a small demo of it and uh, actually present you also a project that has been running on Kaleido, which is project I2I. So a software and a use case. Kun Boom. Hello, uh, my name is Boom. Uh, my new name is Pong uh, I'm working for Ateco, and today I'll present you about Kaleido. Okay. So, how many of you have tried Kaleido before? Any of you? Just one, <laughs> two, three? Okay, so today I will the topic is about like I will introduce you to Kaleido and what it's used for and then like who really use it, is it in production already and then a uh, simple demo. Okay, so first of all, what is Kaleido? So Kaleido is actually a private blockchain that you can create really easily it, and it is Utilizing like cloud platform, you can choose between like AWS or Azure, and then you can create your own tokens, and you can share it between your work co uh, different uh, dev tools, and then there's a marketplace that you can install, and it's of course like very secure uh, using enterprise grade. So, Kaleido is blockchain as a service which you can just click click and use it and you can like create your own private blockchain really easily and you can select between the multiple providers such as get uh, forum or hyperledger Vesu, which i presented last time and since it's a uh, private is there's no transaction fees and so as a developer, I would like to tell you that it like, makes my life really easily easy. So you can see like there's a bunch of uh, services that sometimes like take me to develop for like sometimes, but for Kaleidos, you just click, click, and then the service is there for you. For example, oh, like even silo knowledge token transfer or even like token swap, for example and you can like create your own token with like token factory so let me present you the project that is live and running today called i2i I. it is payment network in philippines is is running on Kaleido platform and it's connecting rural banks to each other okay and so background for uh, in the philippines there's people are like very poor having like less than two dollars a day and they are mostly unbanked and they live in rural areas and a lot of money is come from outside countries from remittance so this really unique problem compared to like thailand so Consensus and Union Bank and Kaleido came up with a solution using uh, inter-rural bank uh, tra transfer using based on Ethereum and they connected the rural banks as a chain and then it's right now launched in last year and it's connecting a lot of banks like 130 banks and it is got the support from Central Bank too. And it's the first Ethereum based network that running live. And right now uh, it's working in domestic, dominant domestic. And in the future they will do international remittance. So let's start with like create your own EC token. So before I start show you how to do it I would like to tell you that uh, the first you need to like create Kaleido account and then create a consortium and then create a environment and create node it seems a lot but 
uh, is very easy. If you go to Kaledo website, you can sign up and then click next a lot of times and then naming things. Um, uh, boom, just before uh, we, we go there on the live demo, does anybody have any question on the project I2I? Because actually it has been uh, a first in the world and it's uh, live and running, payment based on Ethereum. Not yet. Ah, one. Um, just a quick, uh, what do you mean by first Ethereum based payment? Oh, in uh, as using the Kaledo network in Philippines. Okay, so, so like Kaledo is based on Ethereum? Uh, yes, it's running. You can run your the private uh, network using Ethereum with a, uh, a number of clients. Ah, that's a card. Any more questions? The project is a bit different on what we can have in Thailand because the problem that they had to fix in Philippines is that the banks are in very remote places and basically they couldn't get the same uh, services that they got in Manila or that it was taking sometimes. It was very costly uh, to transfer money. So basically uh, through the project that they did on Caledo, they could offer uh, much more financial services to the end bank and very fast with a very low cost. So it's something that actually works very well in the Philippines because basically you can see the size of the country uh, with uh, hundreds of islands. Of course, in Bangkok, you are not going to be able to do the same because basically everything is accessible. But it shows how blockchain actually provided uh, a lot of other services uh, for the end banks. Yeah. And Philippines and like Iceland too. So, so let's continue. Create. Let, let's create your own token. So first, when you create your own nodes and everything you see, like that's node one running, and then on the top left corner you see add, and then you can add services. You see like a lot of services. You all you need is just choose the right one. So for free plan, you can add to only two services. So next, we will create our own token. So let's start with add the token factory click when you click add you can name the token factory and then you wait for a while until the green dots became green as the cursor and then when you click on it you will be able to select like the token you wanna create so you can name it whatever you want like add symbol whatever you want and then you can choose between the type ERC20 or ERC721. So everybody, did, did everybody understand all about like ERC20, right? Okay, I see a lot of agree. So also you can set like if it's minable or you can burn it or not burnable. And then you can create the initial supply. And then you click create contract. And then don't forget to deploy. After it's deployed, uh, it will change status to created, and then you can transfer with different uh, wallet addresses. Okay, and thank you. So for the slide, you can scan and get the slides. And if you want to ask to demo more on Kaledo, please contact us. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Any questions on Kaleido? Yeah. Is it permission or permissionless? Uh, this is a private blockchain, so. So yeah, it's a, it's a permission. So, so the idea is that you invite companies to join the consortium. The consortium is a group of companies that want to share a blockchain. So you give them the permission to join the consortium, and then. They So you you work on some uh, traceability for tuna cans or is that tuna or whatever? Yes. Um, you saw that at the beginning you have to release a certain amount of uh, token, right? In 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 case of uh, some uh, uh, tracking, you need to have a token created all uh, the time, right? Uh, actually, for that project, we are using uh, token seven twenty one. 
so it is quite different from this. Ah, okay, I'm not familiar with yeah. that. Yeah, <laughs> and actually, we this what uh, the tuna tracking we didn't use uh, public blockchain since we wanna it to be like traceable. Yeah, the, the difference is that Kaleido uh, uh, use for private blockchain. On this project, we use the Ethereum mainnet, which was the purpose of it to show transparency. So it was a different setup. Any more questions? Kaleido is actually a, a, a tool that we are using on almost every platform that we are delivering to customer. And uh, actually the, the reason we wanted to present it tonight is that it's actually very user-friendly. You can go and create your account on Kaleido and create your own blockchain own token. It's very easy and uh, we recommend you to use it uh, if you want to get uh, uh, some knowledge about it. And it's, that's free here, so like you can start for free without yeah, it's for free. <laughs> Any more questions? Yeah. So when it comes to I2I project that you guys have, um, so people can actually send fiat money on your blockchain, right? And those uh, people in rural areas, they don't have access to any banks, which means they, there's no ATMs. How do they, you know, get actual money? Okay, so actually they don't need to do like, like this, the phone to send money. Sometimes they can go to some shop like 7-Eleven and let them send money for you, which they don't really need a phone. It's like the just 7-Eleven like have the internet and be able to send the money. Yes. So they don't need a phone. They just like walk to somewhere and That's really the meaning of World War Bank. You have to imagine that there is one guy who has an account in some bank in Manila and who is basically serving people in a very remote area. So they don't have a bank account per se. They just transact with this person. So if they want to make a transfer, they're going to give him cash and then he's going to make transfer on their account. The problem that they were having is that those transfers were expensive. And so they were using Caledo and using a blockchain to make those transactions. They were able to reduce the cost, I think, from 40 peso down to 1 peso, if I remember. So meaning that the individuals will make more transactions, they get fees, which was a benefit for the community. Yeah. And also, if they are sent between banks, right now, like, each bank has their own system, but, like, blockchain help them, like, use this easily. Uh, now I I have the it, it is like up and I created the uh, evening market pay platform and I, I want to apply the blockchain to use uh, and apply in, in my website platform. Yes. Uh, can can I uh, use the Kalido in in my platform? Um, sorry, like the platform is platform like the evening market pay platform. And I, I, I want to uh, everyone and do it for free and not uh, uh, apply blockchain to uh, an AI to, to use in my platform, like a uh, marketplace. Um, how, how, how to uh, apply the blockchain to uh, my platform? Maybe uh, if I can, I can answer on this one. And I think this goes back to what Alexei was mentioning, uh, where is Alexei here? Um, you know, the question is how do you do to use blockchain for enterprise, really, and how do you get started on blockchain for enterprise? And uh, what we start with for every client is education. So, you know, first we need to understand what that you expect from blockchain, so you educate ourselves on what's expected from your blockchain, what's the pain point that you want to resolve, and then we work with you to educate you and your team on how to build a blockchain, what do you need. At this point, it's difficult to answer exactly, but you might be needing something like Omise, for example, if you want to do thousands of transactions per second and you have a high need for capacity on blockchain. You might be needing something like Kaleido if you want everything to be private, for example, in the banking world. And so our job at that at all really is to help you pick the different tools that are the right one for the job and to understand what you need on the business side. And so yeah, if uh, you know, if you'd like to continue the conversation, I'm happy to uh, have a meeting and discuss this together. But practically, if you want it to be private, 
Yeah, just go for Kaleido. Any questions on Kaleido or any other? Anyway, thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much for joining. And um, <laughs> so, what we want to, uh, as I mentioned, what we want to do at this meetup is to present uh, live uh, product and live applications for enterprise. Uh, we welcome anybody. Uh, this is not uh, uh, special for our company or anything. What we wanted to create is a platform for everyone to bring and present their project. If you have a software, uh, blockchain for enterprise, ready uh, product, and in production, you are welcome to contact us and to come over and present. So uh, the next uh, meetup would be on the 26th of February. Uh, we will try to do something regarding uh, decentralized finance. Uh, it's a hot topic of the moment, and there are some companies here in Thailand uh, which are uh, running some projects. So please uh, contact us if you want to present. We will be uh, more than welcome. The pizzas are a bit late and they are arriving in three minutes apparently so if you want to wait there is some beers in the fridge and the pizzas are going to come up and yeah, if you wait five minutes you will have hot pizza here. Thank you so much for joining tonight. Thank you very much to Alexei uh, for the great presentation and representing the museum. Thank you very much. <laughs>